edition of Contemporary Music, releasing the most beautiful sound next to silence since their release of the Mal Waldron Trio's 1969 album, Free at Last. I don't consider myself a collector, really. Not because I don't obsess over things that grab my attention, but only because I lack the motivation to put together anything approaching a collection. But if I did, I think ECM recordings would be a thing that I would collect. And for the first time ever in my series, I get to spend some time with an ECM recording. And right as autumn is starting up, life is good. For those of you not familiar with ECM, well, ECM is not where you go for anything flashy, shreddy, loud, or greasy. At no point has anyone demanded to make their funk the ECM funk. But if you want stark loveliness, next level harmonic exploration, or quiet intensity, that's ECM. Some of my all-time favorite jazz albums were from ECM. Solstice by Ralph Towner. Conference of the Birds by Dave Holland. Night by John Abercrombie. Bright Size Life, Crystal Silence, The Colne Concerts. You get the picture. So when Sean suggested Cloud About Mercury by David Torn for this series, I looked at the cover, I saw Bill Bruford, saw Tony Levin, and saw that it was released on ECM. No hesitation on my part. And it's kind of not surprising that Bill Bruford is part of this because he just has a knack for working with mad scientists of the guitar. Ironically, the only question mark for me was David Torn. Not a name I knew right away. So I did a quick look at David Torn's discography, and oh yes, I have indeed heard David Torn before. David Torn appears on Scarlet's Walk by Tori Amos. He's on three solo albums by Patrick O'Hearn, including 1995 album Trust. He's on a few by Ryuichi Sakamoto. Now that's what I'm talking about! No, not Ryuji. Ryuichi, composer, go find his 1997 album, Discord. It's beautiful, amazing composition. David Torn also recorded with Jack Bruce, Jan Garbarek, Katie Lang, Laurie Anderson, David Bowie. David Bowie is another artist that favored mad scientists of the guitar. A number of them went through his ranks, including Fripp and Ballou. And later on, David Dorn on the Heathen album, the Reality album, and the one called The Next Day. Yeah, I've definitely heard him before. I just didn't know it. Besides being a unique player, David Dorn is also a unique collector of guitars. And I think a quick look on Google can show you a variety of brands and styles that he's played over the years that are every bit as captivating and unique is his style. But a quartet with the rhythm section of Bruford and Levin, and it's on ECM. Yeah, I think this is gonna be a beautiful week. My first overall thought, if Terry Ripdahl had Tom Morello's pedal board, it might sound like what I'm hearing in David Torn's guitar work. Will you for once explain your references instead of assuming that everyone has the same knowledge as you? You know what? Fair point. Terry Ripdahl is a guitarist from Oslo who started his professional career in the early 60s in a Norwegian surf pop band called the Vanguards. He made his jazz debut in 1968 as part of Oslo sax legend Jan Garbarek's band before releasing his first solo album on ECM in 1971. The thing that made Terry Reepdahl's guitar playing unique at the time was that he was playing long, intelligent, complex, melodic passages, but using full distortion electric guitar with extensive use of the whammy bar. I am hearing that same approach to electric guitar in David Torn. Plus, David Torn makes extensive use of a pitch-shifting effect made by Boss called the Boss PS2, which is a direct predecessor to the kind of effect that would later become associated with Rage Against the Machine. 
namely a variable pitch shifting effect created by IVL Technologies called the whammy pedal. With the whammy pedal, it's the, uh, you know, the two octaves up help to really emulate that kind of Southern California gangster rap sound. And it's like... But heady jazz on shreddy guitars is not David Torn's only move. In the very first song, Suyafu Skin, Ellipses, Snapping the Hollow Reed, there are a number of sounds happening that cannot be accounted for with only the instruments listed in the credits. And while the synthesizers in 1986 were capable of much of what I'm hearing, there's one I can't account for, and that's a koto. Now I know it's possible to get sounds like a koto by loosening the strings on an acoustic guitar and jamming a hunk of wood or a drumstick under the strings around the 12th fret and playing it kind of flat and on your lap. Plus, Eric Johnson can mimic a koto by simultaneously picking and fretting with the right hand while bending with the left. But what I'm hearing on Cloud About Mercury sounds like the real thing to me. You know, there's a short list of guitarists in the world that I would call mad scientists. Guys that just deliberately think outside the box and come up with these otherworldly sounds. Adrian Ballou, Robert Fripp is yet another, and David Torn as well, virtuosic Playing meets savvy use of effects. Players that subscribe to the school of thought that basically, you know, let's make a guitar not sound like a guitar. And in track two, the Mercury Grid, we get some new textures. Pitch shifted guitar and pitch shifted trumpet. Synth drums and synth bass. By today's standard, very dated, but only briefly does it diverge into the realm of 80s kitsch. For the majority of the Mercury Grid, it feels to me like some of the Jonas Helborg-era John McLaughlin albums. Where the rhythm section has these odd little synthy bits, but the focus is still clearly on the soloist. The next tune, Three Minutes of Pure Entertainment, is an extension of that modality, right? The rhythm section doesn't actually set up what could be described as a groove or a set of changes more a simmering stochastic background, a landscape onto which various improvisational elements can occur. They finally state the melody about four and a half minutes in, then the groove becomes, if anything, kind of boring. But it was midway through the next track, track four, Previous Man, that I actually had to stop and play the whole album again from the beginning. What I was hearing in The Previous Man was similar to what I was hearing in the previous track. That is, the rhythm section wasn't playing accompaniment as much as they were sculpting scenery. But there was something about it that suddenly drew my attention to Tony Levin. And my brain went, holy smoke. And that thought struck me so powerfully that I had to go back to the beginning of the album and find all of Tony Levin's parts. And yes, at first you barely notice him. And when you finally do, you realize that he was the one holding it all together. The man's brilliant. It was on my second spin of The Previous Man that I was able to take in the whole piece. And yes, the song do get intense. <laughs> I think The Previous Man is my favorite so far. So that just leaves the last sweet network of sparks. The first part, The Delicate Code, is primarily a showcase for David Torn's more lyrical playing, with more Koto-like dives and bends. Nice attention to dynamics as well. And the second part... Egg Learns to Walk, Ellipses, Su Yafu Seal. As technological as it can sound at first, this is, in fact, Pharaoh Sanders Styles' spiritual jazz at heart. And the improvisations by Mark Isham and David Torn, they tear it all the way down and bring it all the way back up. Quietly. If you can get past the very, very 80s sounding drum sounds and the overlong and sparse epilogue, this is actually a very lovely tune. After the first spin or two of this album, I like what I hear. It feels lovely. It feels comfortable. I find Cloud About Mercury interesting, but it might just be because it fits into a niche that I've already conditioned myself to like. If I'm brutally honest, I have to cop to the fact that there are times on Cloud About Mercury that sound precisely like incidental music to Miami Vice or Max Headroom. How do I get to sleep? There were a lot of folks who felt very strongly that things like the Yamaha DX7 and Simmons drums were just another step in the musical technology path that started with the Telharmonium and the Rickenbacker frying pan. But listening today, 
I don't know. I can't help but wonder what these tunes would have sounded like with less dated sounds. But that's the thing, isn't it? The sounds and the monophonic nature of some of the synths of that day, they forced you to think about music in different ways. At this point, Bruford was heavily into the use of electronic drums. The Simmons drums and such were a new thing at the dawn of the 80s. And on the three albums he did with King Crimson, Discipline, Beat, and Three of a Perfect Pair, they really pushed the envelope. Now, of course, decades later, these sounds have not aged as well. But those albums would not be what they were without those sounds. If you were to re-record, for example, track three from Cloud About Mercury, Three Minutes of Pure Entertainment, using less dated set of instruments, then you couldn't have that same percolating kind of a background feel. Playing Bill Bruford's part on a traditional drum set would sound busy and noisy. So, dated though they might be, that defines the character of that song, and it offsets the kind of languid style of the bass and the two lead instruments. By the mid-80s, that Simmons sound was starting to get a little old. And of course, Bruford went on with it for another six or seven years at least. He went back and hooked up with his Yes uh, alumni in uh, Anderson Bruford Wakeman and Howe and brought the Simmons kit. And the live album shows you exactly what those Yes classics sound like with a big cracking fake snare. Not my favorite era, but it was great to hear Bill play those songs with those particular players again. I like Cloud About Mercury. I find the music to be engaging and meditative, but I also admit that I like the music in spite of, not because of, the sonic palette used in its production. I don't know that I will be heavily recommending Cloud About Mercury to others. I mean, David Torn's guitar work is impeccable throughout the whole album. But I recognize that on top of the many other barriers to entry presented by Fusion, this one has the added barrier of using what are, by today's standards, very cheesy sounds. Some other ones that progressive rock fans might enjoy would include Polytown with Mick Karn and Terry Bozio. Levin Torn White, that's right, Alan White from Yes, about 15 years ago, teamed up with Levin and Torn for a all-instrumental, improv-based album. Bruford Levin Upper Extremities, which also includes David on guitar and Chris Bode on trumpet. So imagine Miles jamming with 80s Crimson Rhythm section with another mad scientist on guitar. And Upper Extremities was all done with acoustic drums. And for that reason, it's proven to be one of the most satisfying King Crimson offshoots. For a more modern progressive rock angle, check out a group called The Pineapple Thief. Their album Dissolution from 2018. If you like Porcupine Tree, they're kind of in that ballpark. And also check out Jeff Beck's album, Simply called Jeff. David teamed up with him and took a couple of Jeff's songs and ran them through the blender and reassembled them in really interesting ways. So here's my qualified recommendation. If you own the self-titled Mahavishnu album from 1984, if you're already a fan of Terry Reepdahl, my hunch is you might like Cloud About Mercury. Otherwise, I mean, your mileage may vary. The 80s were weird.